are now employed. Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Ndiho. Joining me on set is Shaka Sali himself, a.k.a. the Kabale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you? I remain simple, easy, and awesome. Terrific, terrific. Uh, a warm welcome to you all our Facebook followers are watching us live. Uh, Shaka Extra Time is a show that comes to you every Tuesday. And today we'll be talking about a wide range of issues, but uh, first, uh, some good news, Shaka. Uh, the South African uh, rugby team won the World uh, Championships at the Springboks. Hmm. Made it again. They not only did they actually make it again, uh, they did it for the third time. The first time was in 1995, one year after the fall of apartheid, and uh, Mandera, the Madiba, was the president mm -hmm. of the Rainbow Nation. 1995, I remember watching uh, the games in the Rwandan capital, Chikari. I was on Sabatiko. Mm -hmm. And then they won it on uh, European soil in 2007 in France. That's correct. And now they have done it again, winning it on the Asian soil in Yokohama, Japan. Uh, interesting. They seem Incredible. to have they seem to have a track record. Uh, like every twelve years, they win a championship. What's all that about? As a matter of fact, uh, they and uh, the All Blacks of New Zealand are the only two teams in the rugby world that have actually won it three times. Uh, interesting. Only three, you know, only two teams that have done that, and South Africa for its, you know, its credit has won each time it has gone to the final, it has won it all. And this particular case, uh, it was very interesting because South Africa was supposed to be an underdog. Mm -hmm. England was supposed to be the team to beat. And of course, when you think about uh, your colonial history of sorts, you're talking about England, which used to be in the driver's seat used to be the master, and South Africa used to be essentially the servant. So the servant actually beat the boss, became the boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the fact that you bring in that, uh, it was interesting to see uh, Prince Harry uh, go back uh, behind the scenes uh, to uh, actually greet uh, the guys who had just won, beat his own country. Yes, and in this particular case, uh, guess what? Uh, it was the first time in South African rugby history, which is 126 years, mm -hmm. that this particular team was in fact captained by an indigenous South African, a black South African. Interesting. You know? Sh Shaka, uh, le let's move on. Uh, that, le let's go now to elsewhere where we don't have uh, good news. We're expecting to have some good news, but. Uh, it doesn't look like things are happening what, uh, the way we wanted it to happen in South Sudan. Uh, those two leaders were supposed to have talks, uh, peace talks, uh, the, for the first time, face-to-face uh, -face peace talks. But it looks like they're shifting goalposts again. Now, what do we make of that development in South Sudan? You know, it is very unfortunate because uh, you and I have had the dubious privilege of covering some of these uh, type of stories. We also have had the dubious privilege of reading about uh, some of uh, the civil wars uh, that ended up uh, in meetings between the two warring parties. And uh, at one time, uh, in fact, they started call, people call, started calling those types of talks, mm -hmm. peace jokes. <laughs> that peace these jokes. individuals were not really serious. I mean, can you imagine, when you think about the vast majority of the people are doing the dying in South Sudan. And yet, the two leaders, I'm talking about President Sarwakir Mayadit and Riyak Machar, they go to attend IGAD meetings in the Ethiopian capital at Sababa. They actually 
agree on what to do. They actually sign these papers and what have you, but they, they basically sign these papers which they don't probably believe in. Because at the end of the day, why is it that they actually sign? Signing seems to be very simple. But when it comes to implementation, they're missing in action, and especially the president himself. I mean, how can you possibly be a leader, and your people are suffering really for all this time, and you can't do the needful? You're talking about South Sudan, which is an incredibly mm. enormously rich country. It has oil. It has one of the most arable, most fertile territories that if in fact it were used properly, it could become the breadbasket of the region and even beyond. Mm. And yet, despite the fact that uh, they do have everything really going for them, right. they have more than in fact enough, more than what is in fact something that they need. But unfortunately, Paul, they do not have enough for the greed. For how long can uh, the South Sudanese people really uh, be on the edges? Uh, at some point, something has to give. W what does it take for these leaders really to realize that uh, they're actually forcing their people, they're forcing their ca country into this uh, state of uh, hopelessness? The question is, why do we, in fact, continue calling them or referring to them as leaders? Because well, in this particular case, who are they in fact leading? And if they are leading, leading them to where? Well, with all due respect, the <clears throat> leaders of that country, both of them, there is the president, Salva Kiyo Mayadit, and uh, uh, the vice president, uh, Riyak, uh, former vice president, Riyak Machar, they are quote-unquote leaders. They have a significant uh, 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 population that supports uh, each one of them. That is very true. Yep. They definitely do have uh, a following, each of them. Mm. But do you sincerely think that uh, what they are doing in terms of the behavior on the ground, do you think that what they are doing is a reflection of what their followers really want or what do they think? Because how can you be a follower when, in fact, you are busy doing the suffering day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out? Come on, man. But Shaka, they argue that uh, they are doing it uh, on behalf of the people of South Sudan. And both parties at uh, uh, court and court uh, have, been, have, been, have said before that they do the things on behalf of the people of South Sudan. Yeah, but you see, talking the talk is really one thing. But walking that talk is quite another, so that your people can, in fact, walk the walk. I think the problem here, I hate to say it, but uh, it seems to me that there is the problem, especially when it comes to the man who happens to be the president of South Sudan, the man that happens to be the commander-in-chief of his armed forces. Because uh, let's face it, you know, some years ago, Riyak Machar, we actually flew into Juba to be part of that government of national unity. And you remember what happened? They almost killed him. Almost killed him. And uh, we were told uh, by President Sarvakir that uh, they almost killed him because uh, there had been some kind of, uh, you know, uh, failed attempt uh, to remove the government. That there was, in fact, uh, uh, a failed coup, and yet there was absolutely no empirical evidence on the ground. Uh, Shaka, uh, these uh, cases, uh, le let's maybe move across uh, to another country where we thought things were going right uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, not too long ago, maybe two, three weeks ago, we were talking about how the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, <coughs> he won uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. We were talking about how He's a reformist. He has been able to uh, rally people around certain causes. Uh, he's uh, uh, brought certain changes uh, that are admirable. Uh, but now we are talking about uh, a, a new wave of violence uh, in Ethiopia. 
uh, that has actually, as we speak, uh, according to the Prime Minister himself, uh, killed about 86 people. What do you make of that? You know, um, you know as well as I do that uh, there are times when we used to talk about Ethiopia. And um, I always showed uh, uh, my admiration mm -hmm. for the person and the leadership of uh, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed. And I still have admiration for him and respect for him. Mm -hmm. And you know as well as I do that uh, I always, in fact, appealed to the international community and to the Nobel Prize for Peace Committee to consider him, in fact, mm -hmm. to be a man who could be the recipient because I felt that he deserved it. He deserved it because, first of all, he brought about uh, some fundamental reforms, really, in Ethiopia. He also ended uh, the more than 20 years war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. He also did something very important. He basically helped to mediate the crisis in neighboring Sudan. Sudan seems to be on the right track right now. But his own country is on fire now. That is true. But then, you see, you have to understand that uh, sometimes change, when you talk about change, change is neither an event nor an incident. Change, we have to grudgingly admit, is a process. And a process requires patience because it requires time. When you are talking about a country that has been democratically challenged for more than two decades, mm. you have to understand that uh, in this particular game, the dynamic of change, it essentially is liked by some who, can, who think they can benefit from it, and is resented by those who feel that by bringing about that type of change, they lose their privileges and all that kind of stuff. And so it's going to take some time, and it's going to require a lot of patience. But I think that Ethiopia is, at least from what I'm seeing, is on the right track. But they need to figure out a little bit more how to make sure that everybody is included. They have to have a sort of inclusive approach. Win-win situation. Right. Not having some winning and others losing. Mm. You have to make sure that that message is understood. And it's not only a message, but that message has also to be reflected in terms of something that is tangible. Something that you can actually touch and feel. Uh, you talked about uh, the Ethiopian uh, Prime Minister mediating uh, peace talks uh, between uh, the two South uh, Sudan uh, leaders. Uh, we have a, a question, a comment here from uh, uh, Beribenti Pascal. Uh, the question of leadership in South Sudan and uh, the eventual attainment of peace and stability will only be rea realized if the current principal actors on the political scene are out of the picture. Also, the involvement of foreign governments needs to be checked by neutral forces, either under the auspices of the African Union or the United Nations. He makes a great point. Uh, you have uh, key players like Uganda, who are, are obviously not uh, taking, uh, who are not neutral. neutral, they're not neutral. And some people have also accused Ethiopia of not taking a neutral uh, position. You know, first of all, uh, at the end of the day, peace and stability is going to be um, real if it is embraced by the people of southern Sudan themselves. It is more than anybody else, the people of southern Sudan, who really have to be very angry and hungry for it because they are the ones who are doing the suffering. The others are participant observers. And so, yes, you can really, you need support from the regional, from the African Union, from the United Nations, the international community, and what have you. But first and foremost, you need 
an agreement on the ground by the people that are doing the suffering and the people who hope to benefit from peace and stability when it finally arrives. Uh, you are watching uh, Shaka Extra Time, a show that comes to you every Tuesday. And today we are talking about a wider range of issues. And uh, before that uh, quick uh, break, uh, we are talking about uh, South Sudan. But now let's shift our, uh, our talks uh, to Rwanda. Uh, the president of Rwanda just made a mini reshuffle, uh, got rid of some army generals and replaced them with others. But uh, more importantly, uh, he also replaced uh, Rwanda's foreign minister, Mr. Richard uh, Sezbella. Uh, your thoughts on that? The doctor with the real clinic. I guess so. I, I don't know if he still has his real thing since he's a politician. He has a real clinic because, first of all, uh, <laughs> he got his uh, medical training at the, the one time famous uh, Makere University, Kampala, medical school at Mulago. He does. I don't know whether he has ever practiced it, but uh, he definitely has that very important credential. He's also someone that uh, has, uh, I think, good uh, diplomatic qualities. Uh, someone that you don't mind really doing business with and all that kind of stuff. I last had him on Straight Talk Africa a couple of years ago when he was the uh, Secretary General of the Arusha-based uh, East African community. Yeah. And the last time, in fact, I met him was uh, at uh, a, a state dinner uh, at uh, Dar es Salaam uh, when... Uh, the Tanzania was celebrating, uh, I think, 50 years of uh, the union between uh, mainland Tanganyika and the island of Zanzibar. And uh, he was actually coming to the end of his uh, contract, and uh, I was asking him uh, what was he planning to do. And he was telling me that uh, he would be going home uh, and see what else he can do. And I said, uh, why don't you perhaps... Uh, uh, look at the United Nations, you could probably fit like a shoe, that kind of stuff. But again, um, I guess for what he characterized as uh, patriotic reasons, he went home and uh, it doesn't look good for him. It's not just because uh, he has actually been replaced by uh, a Mr. Viruta, who until recently was apparently a minister of environment or something of that sort. Correct. But uh, he is reportedly sick. Mm. As a matter of fact, I saw some uh, uh, images uh, of him uh, supposedly in an Israeli hospital. Uh, he seems to have had a problem with uh, his uh, arm or hand or something. There are reports uh, which have not been uh, uh, essentially, um, uh, you know, we, ha we have not been able to cross-check -check them and uh, find them, you know, with some sufficient collaboration and what have you. But the report suggests that uh, he may, in fact, be a victim of poison. Mm. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. Very unfortunate indeed. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, since uh, you talked about uh, Uganda, let's go to Agaba Bride. Uh, please uh, talk about uh, the police brutality towards uh, the opposition leader and journalists in Uganda. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the images coming out of uh, Uganda, uh, the fact that you and I come from uh, the same country, those, ca those images are not representative of what we wish uh, uh, Uganda to be. Your thoughts? You know, it is very, very unfortunate, sincerely, that uh, we can still interact with those types of images coming out of uh, Uganda in 2019. These are the sort of images that a uh, long time ago, uh, many people used to associate with uh, the man who was in charge uh, from 1971 to April 1979. You're talking about uh, Field Marshal Idi Amin Dada. These are not the sort of images that uh, we should have expected uh, coming out of Uganda when a man by the name uh, General Yoweri Museveni 
a graduate of the University of Dar es Salaam, a man who at one time uh, was so contemptuous of African leaders who overstayed in power for longer than like 10 years. Nigerians call it sit tight type of leaders. And the last time I checked, Yoweri Museveni has actually been in the state house for at least 33 years and still going. You know, I cannot believe that a man who says that he had actually gone to the bush because a man called uh, Dr. Apollo Milton Obote and his supporters had actually stolen an election and that he had gone to the bush so that he could fight to restore, in his words, not mine, to restore democracy. And he has on occasion actually boasted that he actually brought Uganda democracy. I don't know what sort of democracy you will be talking about if in fact you are talking about police brutality. I don't know what kind of democracy you are talking about if you see those images of Makere students who are actually being beaten, tortured, harassed by elements of the Ugandan military or security forces in their horrors of residence. I mean, sincerely, is this the kind of uh, democracy that uh, has been restored in a country that at one time uh, uh, a great British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, characterized as the power of Africa? I mean, I don't understand. But what about Ugandans? Are they, in fact, winning victims? Why can't they somehow, how ca why can't they stand together? Why can't they mobilize, organize themselves, and say enough is enough? Because let's face it, each time you are told by dictators or rulers, they tell you that their power, in fact, comes from the masses, mm. that it is the people who actually owns the power and yet in reality you look for those people you can't find them right but why can't they do it because it's not that there is no precedent on the african continent you have for example Burkina faso where you had uh, uh, a man uh, referred to by some as a uh, handsome blaze campayori mm. that man had been in power for about 27 years, still counting. And he tried to change the constitution, to shift the constitution of political goal of course, so that he could actually hang on for a little bit longer. But the young people of Burkina Faso, in cooperation with some elements of the presidential guards, mm. thought otherwise. Mm. And the last time I checked, he's no longer in power. In Wagadu. Shaka, uh, help me understand something. I, I, in fact, maybe le let me tie it to one of the comments here. Uh, when Ugandan opposition leader Chisa Besige uh, travels outside of Uganda, uh, let's say comes to the, the United States here, he's uh, received as a man of international repute and uh, stature. When he goes back to his ho own country where he's supposed to be a leader of opposition, they beat him up like they're beating chicken, a chicken thief. Uh, today I saw soldiers, people with a badge of honor, uh, policemen, officers, police officers, literally putting a pepper spray in his eyes. What do you make of that? And this is not the first time, because yes. uh, the last time, in fact, uh, he nearly went blind. It's history is repeating itself right in front of our eyes. But you know, Paul, mm. there was this great... Uh, uh, American scholar who was born and raised and educated and initially served in Germany. He was called Dr. Professor Albert Einstein. You know, he once actually said mm. that if you continue doing uh, essentially the same thing over and over mm. and over again, 
expecting different results. According to him, he said, that must be insanity. So when you look at uh, these people who are continuing to do the same and the same thing to Dr. Kano Shiza Besije, expecting different things really, they must be suffering from some sort of security political insanity. Sh Shaka, uh, the, U the, the U.S. has been a very, uh, very aggressive in uh, like uh, trying to uh, bring about sanctions uh, for people who violate uh, human rights. Uh, in some cases, uh, they have uh, imposed uh, individual sanctions on some people in the Ugandan uh, government, uh, but they were not as extensive. Uh, in s more, more recently, last week, uh, the United States uh, uh, actually banned uh, Cameroon or suspended Cameroon from the AGOA. They removed the Cameroon race, from, AGOA from the for, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, and the reason? For human rights uh, violations. Mm -hmm. So why can't the same standard apply to Uganda? What is it that uh, Uganda has done for the United States uh, that, can't, uh, that they can't face those uh, similar sanctions? Ideally, of course, uh, you know, that should also apply to a country like Uganda because, as you say, uh, Uganda reflects pretty much the same dynamics, except that Uganda happens to be doing something for the United States in fighting against terrorism in Somalia. But so is Cameroon. It's helping out in the fight against uh, 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 Boko, Haram. Uh, Boko Haram in the Sahel. It was very, very interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's up to the American, you know, policymakers uh, where, they don't, where, where they really see this thing headed. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, uh, whoever, I think, uh, pays the piper calls the tune. Uganda, as you know, uh, continue, continues to benefit enormously from a lot of training programs. Uh, they continue, for example, sending senior military officers uh, to train among some, you know, very good uh, uh, American military academies uh, and other people and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I think that uh, they could actually uh, use their leverage to make sure that uh, their uh, allies in Uganda are going about things in a civilized way, because the people have suffered so much. But at the same time, as I said uh, about the people of Ethiopia, Paul, it's going to have to depend, first and foremost, about whether or not Ugandans are ready and willing to sacrifice such an extent that they are ready to liberate themselves, and they are ready, in a sense, to reclaim their country back. Because it's not only enough, really, for people to say they are the primary stakeholders when it comes to their country. And yet, when it comes to making decisions that affect them, they are missing in action. Uh, you have less than 15 seconds. What are you talking about tomorrow, very briefly? Tomorrow we are going to Cameroon. We're going to look at uh, the current political crisis in Cameroon and how it can possibly be resolved. Well, on that note, I thank you so much. It's been a pleasure hosting you. I look forward to hosting you on another edition of uh, Shaka Extra Time. Until then, uh, so long uh, from Washington. And to you all our fans, uh, keep uh, bringing those uh, comments. Uh, we appreciate them right here. Thank you so much, Shaka. Thank you, people. Yeah, take care. Mm -hmm. See you, you next too. week. Thank you.